we have never received one cent of housing funding from either the government of Canada or the government of the Northwest Territories. Tonight, when a house is not a home, some Northerners worry they'll be hard-pressed to afford rent when they retire despite the best efforts of advocates. A little bird flying against oppressive winds, determination, passion, perseverance, a trust, a pride in her bloodline. Poetic justice. Ottawa's new poet laureate is bent on erasing bigotry and prejudice with the power of words. She's on. Good to go. Time to lay a hurtin' down on some turkeys. And the new Wild North Adventures show is about to put hunting and gathering in a whole new light. Good evening, I'm Melissa Ridgen with your APTN National News. Uh, Nunavut now has 50 cases of COVID-19. 46 of them are in the capital, Iqaluit. Schools and non-essential businesses in Iqaluit remain closed and contact tracing continues throughout the community of around 7,000 people. According to Nunavut's Chief Public Health Officer, it's likely to stay that way for quite some time to come. We're still... Um trying to catch up to the chain of transmission. We're further along than we were when this started, when, uh, when we became aware that COVID was in the city. It had probably been here for at least seven or eight days. Um, and we're, uh, as of Monday, we're more like four days behind it. So we're catching up, we're making progress. But until we're uh, uh, caught up, the measures need to stay where they are for now. Yukon Liberal leader Sandy Silver is hinting that a travel bubble is in the works between the Yukon and the Northwest Territories. The two territories have low COVID case counts and fairly high vaccine uptake. Silver says the Yukon is currently working with Northwest Territories to make sure families living on both sides of the border can gather. Well, there's a lot of uh, family connections. Uh, you can imagine in my community of Dawson City, uh, Old Crow, also Fort McPherson, there's family, uh, you know, throughout the, uh, the Gwich'in families. Um, and, you know, people are uh, getting a little restless and want to, uh, want to see nieces and nephews that uh, are on the other side of a border that uh, a lot of these Indigenous uh, folks don't see. Still in the north where our Kent Driscoll joins us. Nunavut's MP has just announced she's taking a second leave of absence to deal with personal medical problems. Kent, what's going on and how did we get here? Thanks. Yes, yesterday, Nunavut's MP, the NDP's Mumilak Kakak, announced on Twitter she was taking a two-week leave of absence from her duties as Nunavut's only MP. Now, if that sounds familiar, it should. Kakak took a leave in October of last year that extended all the way into January. That leave was for, quote, extreme burnout, pressure, and anxiety. Now, in the statement she put out on Twitter Tuesday, Kakak wrote, I continue to struggle with some personal health problems. Recently, the doctor has suggested I take some time off to heal. Now, this decision comes hot on the heels of Kakak getting into an ongoing argument with Labrador Liberal MP Yvonne Jones. After some back and forth in the House of Commons on April 16th, Kakak responded to a two-year-old tweet about Jones, saying, quote, Jones is not an Inuk. Now, Jones is a member of the Nunatakavut group in Labrador. They represent people not represented by the Nunatsiavut land claim in northern Labrador. Well, Jones took offense and asked for an apology in the House on April 19th. Kakak doubled down. She put out a 30-minute video demanding that Jones, quote, validate her Inukness. Kakak added, quote, I'm not going to apologize. I know, until I'm proven otherwise, Yvonne Jones is not Inuk. Until you can tell me who your family is and where you come from and how you're Inuk and validate your Inukness, you have no space to say you're Inuk. Stop saying you're Inuk. Then, after stating repeatedly she wouldn't apologize, she did saying that she was sorry for her, quote, aggressive and disrespectful comments. Then a few days later, and Kakak's on leave, and Canada's largest geographic riding is without an MP for at least the time being. Back to you in Winnipeg. Thanks for that, Kent. 
Well, with a need for affordable housing in Yellowknife, Indigenous leaders have been applying for government funding. But what happens when projects are rejected? Our reporter Charlotte Mort Jacobs looks into the frustrations felt by the North Slave Métis Alliance. This is the spot in downtown Yellowknife Bill Inge had selected to address housing needs of North Slave Métis Alliance elders. Well, there it is. One, two, three. Close to amenities, he hopes the federal government's rapid housing initiative funding would turn this into this, a 12-unit seniors' living complex. President of North Slave Métis Alliance, Bill Inge, represents roughly 300 members, many of whom live in the capital. At least 10 members are looking for seniors' housing. Cost of living in Yellowknife is one of the highest in Canada. Many of our elders are retiring and moving out of the workforce. Many of them don't own their own homes, they're renters. But now without an income, they can't afford the rent. The North Slave Métis Alliance submitted their proposal for the Rapid Housing Initiative National Funding but were rejected because the territorial government was already sitting on a $60 million housing fund. But NSMA's seniors project wasn't receiving anything from that either. NSMA member Bob Mercury has been renting a bedroom in a shared home for the last nine years. And even for a one bedroom, I've seen, you know, $1,700. You know, that's, that's a mortgage payment. Born and raised in Yellowknife, he's seen the cost of living skyrocket. Uh, we discussed it, and uh, we we were right. I mean, we were behind him, and uh, figured, yeah, this this looks really, really, well, uh, really good. Would you have ever thought for yourself to to move oh, yeah. in? Yeah. The recent federal budget pledges 25 million dollars in 2021-2022 to the NWT for housing. But whether NSMA will benefit is another story. And we have never received one cent of housing funding from either the government of Canada or the government of the Northwest Territories through the Northwest Territories Housing Corporation. The North Slave Métis Alliance have secured judicial recognition of its Section 35 rights as Métis. But President Inge says without a direct seat at the table for the Acacia land negotiations, funding opportunities are often missed by his membership. APTN News reached out to Indigenous Services Canada and Territorial Indigenous Affairs to ask them what funding opportunities North Slave Métis Alliance are entitled to and have received. However, we did not receive a comment by airtime. Meanwhile, the NWT Housing Minister says no housing proposals from the Rapid Housing Initiative were rejected indefinitely. And the GNWT is exploring other means of funding, including NSMA's project. Well, I could have my department reach out and see what, what is it that they want to accomplish, what, you know, what uh, issue, housing issue they want to address, and we could work with them that way as well. And on top here is a patio. Uh, a fight Ingi has no plans of giving up on. Up Charlotte Mort Jacobs, APTN National News, Yellowknife. We want to hear what you think about how governments fund housing. Here's how you can continue the conversation. Send us your emails to news at aptn.ca. You can leave a comment on aptnnews.ca. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and now TikTok. Follow APTN News to join the conversation and see our latest stories. Well, we have to take a break, but coming up, the city of Ottawa has a new poet laureate who also happens to be Algonquin. In the context of the global pandemic, it's fitting that this year's theme for National Poetry Month is resilience. The two unions representing teachers and support staff in the northern Quebec region of Nunavik initiated a one-day strike today. They say that there haven't been any quality of life improvements there for 20 years. Lindsay Richardson brings us more from the picket line. They gathered outside the Katowic School Board's Montreal offices to make some noise. We are in solidarity with all the members of the personnel of the school, the 
get to this. And they did. Their message. Uh, we need to tell them that what happens in Nunavik doesn't stay there. It's here, it's all around us, it's all over Quebec. Your working conditions are important and things have to change now. Things have to change now! Things have to change now! The two unions representing teachers from the northern Quebec region of Nunavik fought for 20 years to improve working conditions. Four rounds of negotiation passed, but no change. We need to send a strong message that we won't take no uh, anymore. You know, they have to say yes to some of our demands. Union President Larry Beau says the 700 teachers and support staff workers in the north are largely ignored. Locally hired teachers from the Inuit territory need better outings, rent subsidies, and better premiums. He also says high turnover at Katavik impacts education quality for its Inuit students. Other union heads agree. Les élèves du Nunavik, les Inuits ont droit à des services professionnels de qualité, comme tous les autres élèves au Québec. Caroline Desmarais says psychosocial needs in the North are particular. Many students have special needs, but Katavik only has one psychologist on staff, and they handle the caseload for all of Nunavik's 14 communities. Demandez-vous pas pourquoi on n'est pas capable de maintenir nos membres dans les communautés du Nunavik? On les épuise, on les vide de leurs ressources. Together, the two teachers' unions say what they're doing here is more than just pressure tactics. It's a cry for help and a plea for the government and the school board to pull up their bootstraps, give a little in negotiations, and even out the educational playing field for everyone. If we compare the education system in the north with what it is in the south, you know, you cannot compare them. Today's demonstration was the first of five possible strike days, and union representatives on both sides say they intend to continue if their needs are not met shortly. Now, we reached out to the Katavik School Board to get their input on what's going on, and they said that they won't comment while negotiations are ongoing. Lindsay Richardson, APTN National News, Montreal. Thanks, Lindsay. Well, April is National Poetry Month, and the theme is resilience. This year's focus is around climate change, mental health, and systemic racism. To mark the occasion, the City of Ottawa is appointing a new English-speaking poet laureate. And as Jamie Pashagumskim reports, he's hoping to bring some healing to the city with an Indigenous perspective. Making it official, Wednesday's council meeting began with a reading from the city's newest English-speaking poet laureate. Albert Dumont is an Algonquin from the nearby community of Kitiganzibi and Anishinaabe. A little bird flying against oppressive winds, determination, passion, perseverance, a trust, a pride in her bloodline. Push her onward, push her forward. I point to her and tell my children my grandchildren, and all my future generations. Be like her. Bring her into your dreams. Ottawa Mayor Jim Watson honored poetry as an integral part of Ottawa culture and says it's especially important today. In the context of the global pandemic, it's fitting that this year's theme for National Poetry Month is resilience, perhaps a much-needed reminder of our capacity to recover quickly from difficulties. Resilience is Dumont's first commissioned poem. He says it's inspired from a time when he was working as a bricklayer and suffering from alcoholism. The little bird wasn't given up, you know, against a storm. And that's what I, I, I try to tell kids about uh, uh, rejecting hatred and racism and also to remind uh, people to, to to make a life for themselves a good life during his two-year term as poet laureate dumont wants to use his poetry to erase bigotry and prejudice from canada's capital city we're living a, in a, at a time right now where a lot of people are disheartened they're discouraged and uh, they need to be spiritually and emotionally uplifted i think and uh, uh for, and uh, trust me uh, when it comes to uh, pain there's no pain greater than emotional pain dumont wants to start his tenure speaking with the less fortunate on the streets of ottawa and to bring attention to the city's homeless population using the power of words a little bird flying against oppressive winds never giving up never in retreat her wings fluttering her drum singing, 
never giving a thought to assimilation. Jimmy Pashigomska, APTN National News, Ottawa. Well, it's time for another break, but when we come back, hunting for a new reality show, we've got you covered. They approached me and said, hey, would you like a television show? And of course, I said, I said, of course, yes, because I'm the first female um, First Nation hunting show on, on national television for Wild TV. Welcome back. It's time now for our photo of the day. This photo was sent in by Jordan Dene. He captured this from a beautiful sunset over downtown Winnipeg uh, from the riverbanks of the Red River. Keep those great photos coming. We love scenics from where you live, you know, cute kids, elders, food. You can email them to share at aptn.ca and you might be featured as our next photo of the day. Let's now take a look at tomorrow's weather forecast. Off to the east coast, we got Cloud and uh, 9 for St. John, 16 the Sunshine for Charlottetown. La Grand River, sunny and 5 degrees. Kujawak, snow, 3. Lots of sunshine over in Gas Bay, 10 degrees there. Same with Sediel, uh, 16 for Montreal. Toronto, 12 and some showers expected, 17 in Ottawa. 8 with a mix of sun and cloud in Sioux Lookout, 4 and some flurries expected up in Big Trout Lake. Sunshine and 4 degrees for Thompson. Minus 4 and snow for Churchill. 10 and sunshine expected for Winnipeg. 12 and sunny over in Brandon. 11 with a mix of sun and cloud in Saskatoon. 10 and sunny in Yorkton. 6 and sunshine for Buffalo Narrows. 7 and sunny for Lorange. 1 up in Stony Rapids. Sunshine there too. 16 and some showers expected for Grand Prairie. 5 in Fort Chip and sunshine there. 17 in Cloud for Edmonton, possibility of showers, 23 in Sunny in Lethbridge. Kamloops, 22, showers expected, 15 Cloud for Quinell and uh, 15 degrees, 9 in Dees Lake, cloudy skies, Fort Nelson, mix of sun and cloud and 10. Dawson City, 9 and Sunny, 8 for Whitehorse with a possibility of flurries. Wati, 0 and sunny skies, Sunny in Norman Wells and 8 degrees. In Nuvik and Tuktoyak, Tuk, both minus 1 and Sunny, Polytech minus 3, sunny skies there too. Chesterfield, uh, snow, minus 7. New Yacht, sunshine, minus 9. Joe Haven, minus 12. And sunny skies, Arctic Bay, some snow expected, minus 1. Clyde River, mix of sun and cloud, minus 3. A young Ojibwe woman from northern Ontario has taken her hunting and fishing skills to a whole new level. She's living, leading, and sharing a positive example of her First Nation hunting heritage. Here's Annette Francis with that story. Shauna Erickson, along with her husband Chris and guide Ken, are getting ready for an evening On shoot. Sweet. One that will involve both hunting and cameras. Safety's on. Good to go. Time to lay a hurtin' down on some turkeys. This husband and wife team live a field-to-table lifestyle, but they're not only here to put food on the table. They're also creating an episode for a television series called Wild North Adventures. It's a project Erickson began on her own a few years ago. I started filming my own hunts and just putting it on YouTube, and then I guess the hunts got put to the CEO of Wild TV, Canada's leading hunting and fishing network, and they approached me and said, hey, would you like a television show? And of course, I said, of, I said, of course, yes, because I'm the first female um, First Nation hunting show on, on national television for Wild TV. Erickson is Ojibwe and a member of the Matachuan First Nation. She learned her fishing and hunting skills from her father. And while she says it's great to be able to educate others on her way of life and culture on a national platform, she also occasionally receives hate mail. I take it as a blessing. Uh, I give my tobacco. I give my thanks. I speak to my elders on how I should portray myself because everyone's watching. All eyes are on me and, and we haven't done this before. So to be able to have an opportunity like this, to be able to speak out about um, the way that we do things, our beliefs, our, how important our family, our people, our elders, our knowledge, our, our language is, is to us, it's not just a hunting show. 
it's it's um, education. According to Erickson, Wild North Adventures has now signed on for a second season with four national networks. They're creating 18 new episodes. It's an opportunity for Erickson to learn as well. But this is the first time that I've ever cleaned a turkey. This is my second turkey that I've ever shot in my lifetime. So where we're from, we have bear and moose and grouse and you name it, but we don't have turkeys. So I'm, I'm learning from, from uh, probably one of the best here in the area. And uh, I'm enjoying it. I love learning new skills of the trade when we're outdoors. And um, this is like being able to provide a filled to table lifestyle for my family is probably one of the most important things that I've ever done. Erickson has two more days to hunt turkeys before heading to Lake Superior to fish during the spring run. Anna Francis, APTN National News, Alderville, First Nation. Looking forward to that one. Uh, the Derek Chauvin guilty verdict in the murder of George Floyd has once again opened up the conversation about police brutality, but also calls to rethink the role of police and how calls for service should be could be redistributed outside of police with better outcomes for many. With the topic of In Focus, take a look. That's where, thank goodness, the system worked in this particular situation. You know, it was a sense of relief because I believe the city as well as the rest of the world was not exactly prepared for the outcome if a not guilty verdict were to come. And I say that to say in the city of Minneapolis alone, which is where the trial was held, there were thousands of National Guard troopers on standby. Most people won't know this, but this is a, a Statistics Canada um, uh, statistic that upwards of 80% of what the police deal with are non-criminal calls in nature, mm -hmm. most mm -hmm. of those being mental health calls. So why is it that the number one emergency response that we have for people who are going through a mental health crisis is police? They don't deal with those crises well. Chantel Moore, Rodney Levi, another mm -hmm. Indigenous man who was killed on the East Coast, um, Regis Korczynski Paquette, DeAndre Campbell, these are all people who are experiencing a mental health crisis when police killed them. We need to take all of the billions of dollars that we put into police and take some of that money to create a new emergency service that's going to deal with mental health. In Saskatoon here, they had a new police chief come in and they cleaned up a lot of stuff, but there's still, it still happens. There's uh, people roughed up on the streets and stuff like this. Uh, uh, we, racism runs very deep in the, in the prairies here, mm -hmm. and uh, our people always seem to be on the receiving end of it. So I think there's a, a lot that has to be done. The RSP um, has got to look at their own history. You can download that episode of In Focus on Police Brutality as a podcast uh, at aptnnews.ca slash infocus. That is a wrap on your midweek news. I'm Melissa Ridgen. Thanks for tuning in. Have a great night.